This here, what you're about to see, uh, this is the first time we actually presented. Right? This was uh, data for a PhD dissertation for a friend of mine who was the director of this project. Right? And I got his permission to present it in front of all of you. And uh, let's go. So La Consentida, Oaxaca, Mexico. Uh, let me turn off the slides. You guys don't need to look at this. So, uh, uh, as you can see here is uh, San Diego City College, and I also am the principal investigator for Marine and Archaeological, in case uh, you need some uh, excavators, right? So, uh, first things first, the acknowledgments, first and foremost, they go to the Institute of National History and Anthropology of Mexico. Without their, without their blessings and supervision and everything else, this would have never happened, right? Guy David Hitt is my friend from uh, CSU San Bernardino, who's the director of this project. Mr. Sandberg did all the histological analysis of the teeth that were extracted from the burials, right? And San Jose de Progreso is the closest community to the site of La Consentida, right? There are people there uh, that were very welcoming, that were very warm to us, and a lot of them actually got hired by Mexican law to be laborers out of the field, right? So uh, we went out there, followed all the rules, hired all the locals, and it was a real successful project. So, so here we go. First thing we need to know is where like, you know, whereabouts La Consentida you know, is. And here you have Mexico, and down south here you have the state of Oaxaca. And in the state of Oaxaca, you have Laguna Pastoria, uh, Laguna stands for Lagoon, and over here you have Laguna Chacawa, which are the Mexican government turned them into national parks a while ago, right? So they're protected from development and all that kind of stuff, which actually helps a lot because the site of La Consentida is right here. Here you have other sites for Cabeza de Vaca, Charco Redondo, which I did also, Juve, which we also did some uh, bioarchaeology, Rio Viejo, we spent a long time working at those sites as well. And here, I guess the reason why this area is so lush and prolific, here you have the Rio Viejo here turns into the Rio Verde. It's one of the biggest rivers in Mexico, right? It's And the whole area, as you're gonna be able to see here, is very, very lush, right? There's a river right there. Here's some development. La Consentida is in there somewhere, right? The, the problem with the site of La Consentida is it's at least, I don't know, maybe 3,000 years old. So the jungle basically turned everything into mush. It's very hard to locate. And there's a close-up, and the site is in there somewhere, right? Per protocol, I'm not supposed to give you the exact location. I'm not supposed to give you coordinates. I'm sure you, I'm sure you guys will understand. Right? So in order to understand La Consentida, you need to understand the context, right? The, the context of the whole Rio Verde, regional, cultural, whatever, right? So the first thing they did here, and this started about 30 years ago, they decided to come up with a temporal sequence, which makes perfect sense, right? Without temporal sequence, then you just uh, relegate it to relative dating, and that doesn't really help anybody. We wanted to have some good dates here, and the, the periods that I'm going to be talking about, they're in the initial early form of the period of coastal Oaxaca, and we have good six radiocarbon dates ranging from 1947 to 1530 before the common era. Now, how do you come up with these names here? What we do, right, what our Kelly's out of the field do, we actually take radiocarbon dates, we associate it with, in some cases, ceramic, we sometimes associate it with building techniques, etc. right? Lucky for me, I was not the one who actually had to do that here, but the professor, not not hip, but a guy by the name of Arthur Joyce from uh, Colorado, who's been there for like 35 years or something. He's the one who actually came up with all of this, right? All the dates and stuff. And so far, nobody has been able to depart it. So, so we, did, we believe the dates are pretty good here, right? So that like watch it phase from the initial early form of the period spans that time period right there. And then you have Charco, Minisuyo, Miniyua, Chacawa, Coyuche, Yutatiyu, you weigh and you could suck, right? Uh, but you could suck here, it's already in the late post-classic, post as you can see. All this stuff here is AD or common era, if you will, right? So this is where this is where we're actually going to be talking about here because it so happens 
that this is some of the oldest sites that we know of so far in the Mexican coast. So far that we know of. Right? So, no, not in the Mexican coast, in the Oaxacan coast. And, uh, see here, because the jungle basically destroys everything. You're never going to find pyramids, altars, none of that. What you're going to do is find mounds here. And you can see by this topo map here, oops. You can see by the topo map, here we have a mound. There's another one right there, another one here, here, and there. So what they ended up doing in 2009, they excavated it right there. And then in 2012, we excavated it over here. And this is where the majority of the burials come from, right? Because they're better, pres they're better preserved and there's more of them. I believe here we only rescued two of them, if I, rem if I remember correctly. I was not there at those excavations. Although I did get to analyze those there. So let's see, and over here you also see another set of operations, excavation operations right here. But that is uh, the result of those operations is more like on the archaeological side of things, right? We're going to stay on bio as much as we can. So this is basically where the burials came from, right? Some of the oldest burials here, we are guesstimating, right, based on the radiocarbon dates that I talked about before, they're about 3,600, almost 4,000 years old, right? And the cute thing about this is that the deeper the burial, the better preserved they are, right? And there's reasons for that. We'll get into that, right? So this is what we call a block excavation in which we control verticality and horizontality, right? We needed to see how wide or how far spread out this burial area was and how deep it went. And I believe it's only about two and a half meters. And there you see that we push an auger just to make sure that we were not missing anything, right? And we were. Uh, after this here, all we got was sand, river sand, right? So we pretty much exhausted it. Although we're going back, we're going back to the area. It's not, it's not over by an ocean. Uh, to summarize, we have 12 aerials excavated in 2009 and 2012, right? And out of those 12 aerials, we have 14 sets of individual human remains, right? So the question is, how come you have 12 burials, but then you have four persons, right? Well, sometimes in a burial, you'll have two people or three people, right? Those are what we call the, well, I don't remember what we call it. <laughs> but, but yeah, we have single burials with single individuals, and then we have single burials with multiple individuals, right? So uh, if there's any questions about this, we'll get it at the end. I, the important part here is that we did have 14 sets of individual human remains, male, female, and little kids. Right. So, before we start with the burials of La Consentida, for those of you who are not familiar with bioarchaeology, I guess it's a good thing to tell you how we look at some of these burials, right? So, we have primary burials, oops, we have primary burials here, and then we have secondary burials. The difference between one and the other is that if somebody let's say drops dead here, and then we find them a thousand years from now, and nobody touched that, body, that would be considered a primary burial. Now, if this person dropped dead here, and then they relocated him somewhere else, and then like rearranged the bones nice and neatly, but this one's over here, that's what we call a secondary burial, right? And there's many countries in the world that still do that, like Bolivia, for instance, right? Where the cemeteries in the capital, La Paz, nobody fits there anymore. So what they do, they bury people, then they dig them up a year later, and then they rearrange the bones neatly in niches. So from a primary burial, it goes into a secondary burial. I hope that's clear. Right. Now here we have extended burial on their stomach, extended on their back, extended on the right side, and I'm not sure some photos of that, extended on the left side, semi-flex, and flex, and tightly flex, which used to be called the fetal position back in the day. We don't use that, at least I don't use that terminology anymore, right? It's either flex or not, and it's either semi-flex, flex, or really tight flex. And in some cases, like in Peru, especially in, during the Inca times, you'll find sitting burials, right? And some of them are sitting sort of like upright, and some appear to be sitting like upside down, right? We're not gonna get into that too much. And then obviously you have cremations, right? In the case of this burial over here, we know that when you drop dead, you don't fold your arms and cross your legs or any of that. This was actually intentionally modified by somebody to make it look like this, right? We don't know 
This came here from Google because we are very limited as to the data we can present on human remains, right? This came, it came from Google, so the photographs are sort of like, they don't have any copyrights as far as I know. So uh, I don't remember where this came from, but that's not the point. The point here is the position of the bones and the human manipulation of them, if you will, right? This person died, somebody took care of that person, rearranged the bones. That turns it into a secondary. So now this one here, this one is from La Consentida, right here. This is one of the best burials that I've ever uh, analyzed. It's one of the deepest ones also. It was probably about 3,500 years old, right? Uh, you'll see here you have burial A, individual 10, right? So these are field designations, right? This is the eight burial we find. And after summing up the individuals of all those eight burials, this person becomes number 10. So somewhere there before burial A, there was like a multiple burial. That's what I meant to say, a, mul a multiple burial somewhere, right? So uh, here we know that this person is on, uh, turned out to be a she. Uh, she's on her stomach. Why? I can see the ischium bones right there. And that is what you're feeling against your chair right now as you're sitting down. This is the backside or yeah, the back side of the, of the kneecaps, if you will. Here you have uh, femoral condyles, tibial condyles, etc. right? The back of the head. So extended ventral. And again, this here are field designations, right? After all the work is done and the reports are put together, you should need those numbers. As you're going to be able to see at the end of the presentation, will change to something else. I believe this one is called burial 14 or something. Like that, right? So... So here you can see the face right there, so you know that this person is lying on his back, right? His, her back. I, I, I don't know if this guy's a male or a female, right? Which, by the way, when I say male or female, I don't mean woman or man or any other type of gender identity. We're talking about biological sex, right? So I'm pretty sure you guys understand the difference. And if not, you know, we'll talk about it at the end. This is a semi-flex barium, not, also not from La Concertina. You will notice that the legs are pretty relaxed. The arms are also pretty relaxed. It almost seems like they just dropped this guy on, on, on the ground. Right? Uh, here you see the mandible. The skull is missing. We have this thing in, our, in archaeology called taphonomy. And, and taphonomy basically explains to you what happens to your body from the time we bury you until the time we find you again. Right? In some cases, if you have acidic soil, the fun of me is bad because they don't need to weigh all the bone, right? And if you have an alkaline soil, right, opposite of acidic, like uh, as it happens in the coast here, especially in La Jolla, the fun of me is pretty good because some of those burials are preserved by 7,000, 8,000 years. Right? So if you go into the desert, the fun of me not that good because somebody drops dead, the coyotes come and take body parts away, right? Uh, sun bleaching and everything, right? It makes it really bad for us to recovered, let alone identify the person who died, right? So taphonomy is bad. In this case, taphonomy is good, but because of taphonomy, the skull is gone, right? Or maybe somebody picked it up before they took the photo. There's no way to know on this one, right? But again, we have a lot of, uh, we, we, we must, uh, let's see, let's see, uh, be sensible when it comes to showing human remains, right? Because of uh, Native American concerns and that kind of stuff, right? But photos in the internet, I don't think there's a, there are any regulations for them. That's why I put it there. Now, this one here, that is a tightly flexed burial right there. Not, also, not from Michael Zadida, this came from Google. And uh, Mexican law is different than, let's say, NACPRA guidelines and stuff like that, right? In Mexico, you need to follow not just Mexico, Peru, Bolivia, basically almost in South America and Central America, right? You need to follow federal guidelines, which means that. Archaeology, in this case, belongs to the country. It does not belong to any given group. It does not belong to the tribes. It does not belong to the archaeologists, definitely, right? It never does. It does not belong to the universities. It belongs to all Mexicans slash the government, right? And if you get caught doing bad things by the Mexican government, I believe that the last I heard about 10 years ago, you're talking about 10 years in jail with no problem. Right? So they're very, very stringent as to their laws, right? Now, this one here, we did not find any flex burials in La Consentida. So, photo from Google, we do know that there's flex burials in San Diego associated with the Rahoyan 
uh, time period or culture, whatever you want to call it, right? But just so you know what one looks like, the legs are tightly flexed, right? The arms are sort of like touching uh, the feet. Now here, if I was to look at that brain sciatic notch right there, right? Just by looking at the photo, I would probably surmise that this is a female. Just by looking at that, right? But that would be sort of like an initial type of identification. That would actually mean better than a photograph, but more things than a photograph to, to determine the biological sex of the person. And on this flex period, sometimes their arms are like this. In some cases, they're pulling like this. So this is not sort of like a, the only, I guess, example of, of what a flex period should be. But I think you get the idea. Right? Uh, that one is pretty tight. This other one, not so much. Right? Next. This is a, a seated barrier, right? And this comes from Cusco. No, not Cusco, I'm sorry, from, from Lima, the capital of Peru, which used to be uh, the capital of uh, Spanish when they conquered it, right? And uh, known for its Inca activity. And most Inca burials around the time of the conquest buried uh, their people in a seated position facing the east, right? And they were facing the east supposedly because that's where the sun comes up. And to the Inca, the sun was sacred. Uh, used to be, uh, they used to call it Inti, Inti the sign guy. So uh, back in the early days of Catholicism, okay, uh, people were buried in such a way that if there was ever going to be a resurrection, they would actually get up and face the east right, when the sun rises as to welcoming, you know, being welcomed by God or something, right? So the Inca are not the only ones who, who use uh, the east as some sort of a magic or religious for a magical religious purpose, right? And people still do it now. And this one here, not much I can say about this, but in a different presentation, I'll probably do that. Now, the skeletal demographics that bioarchaeologists look for, right? And uh, I'm pretty sure forensic anthropologists do the same thing, but forensics and bioarchaeology, they're a little different, right? In the sense that forensic usually deals with legal cases, it deals with tissue. Whereas us bioarchaeologists, we deal with neither, right? Thank God, because uh, I don't really like to see dead people too much. So the demographics here, uh, we look into biological sex, again, independent of gender, gender identification, etc. right? We have uh, male or female, all right? And, uh, but it's not as simple as that, I'll get to that in a second. Chronological age, as you know, you have chronological age, you have uh, biological age, and then you have psychological age, right? Chronological, in this case, today, is like the day you were born, right? Uh, what's on your driver's license, per se, right? Uh, we look for possible causes of death, right? And it's very difficult sometimes in the archaeological setting to find good pointers as to causes of death. As a matter of fact, of the 14, the 14 barriers that, I want, that I'm going to talk about today, only one had a possible cause of death. So, paleopathologies, which is ancient diseases, right? We spot them right away in the archaeological uh, records. And then dental pathologies there, which we also can spot really, really accurate. So, biological sex. Okay, I told you that we have male and female, right? Uh, nowadays, obviously, we now understand that intersex is also a valid biological sexual designation, right? But there's no way to determine that with skeletons, right? So in our case here, we have either male, possible male, indeterminate, possible female, and female, right? Based on markers on the human skeleton, right? We, again, we never talk about gender or any of that because it's really not relevant when it comes to bioarchaeology. So after everything is said and done, right? So the first thing that you need to understand here is that in order to get a good uh, let's say, assessment of the person that you are analyzing. Probably the first thing that you need to understand is the sex, the sex of that person, the biological sex of the person, before you do anything else, right? Because uh, it is a known fact, and some people might call it sexist, but it's a known fact that females mature sooner than guys on an average over these two years. They mature uh, not only physically, but mentally, intellectually, romantically, etc. right? Us guys, it takes a little longer to mature. Therefore, if you have a person that matures sooner than another person, you need to know the sex before you determine their biological age. Does that make sense? So, uh, 
Let's see how it said that. Let me get back here. So some of the markers that we use uh, to determine the, the sex biological. Every time I say sex, by the way, or sexing, the skeleton means biological sex. Right? So uh, here we use the back, of, the back of the head, which is the occipital pituitaries here. Right? If you guys touch the back of your head like this, some of you are going to feel a bump, and then some of you won't. Right? The more robust your neck muscles are, the stronger, the more pronounced that bump is going to be because bone has to react to muscle. Right? The stronger the muscle, the stronger the bone, per se. Here we have a female, probable female, indeterminate, possible male, and total male right there. Not total male, but definitely male. Right? And, and actually, if you have a better hat, when you guys go home, <laughs> compare the back of your heads, and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> like I tell my students, just the back of the head. Right? <laughs> yeah, you never know. Now here you have a mastoid plasma. Now you tap yourself in the back of the ear, you can feel it right there, right? So if you don't have a lot of it, most likely female, uh, probable female, indeterminate, probable male, definitely male. Now this one here, I wouldn't recommend that you do because you actually have to pinch in the eyeball, right? And uh, you might hurt yourself. But we do this with skulls because they don't have eyes anymore. So same thing, female all the way to male. Now the glabella right here, this part right here, is very is more pronounced in males than it is in females. Actually, all of this here is more pronounced in males than it is in females, right? And it sounds a little sexist, yeah, but nature is sexist. This is thanks to nature, nothing else, right? So uh, let's see, the more robust the skeleton, with some exceptions, is usually tilting towards male. Right? And we call that an anthropology sexual dimorphism. Right? Uh, you see sexual dimorphism in all species of animals. Right? The, you know that the male lion is bigger and stronger than the female lion. Right? I believe only some type of spiders, they show it in reverse. That's why they call the black widow a black widow, because she's bigger and stronger than the male counterpart. And when they mate, she kills him. Right? And, uh, but you don't have too many species in the world where the female is more robust and stronger than males. Simply put, Sexual dimorphism, thanks to nature. Or some might blame it on God, I don't know. Right? So he shoot. Uh, here we have uh, the mental eminence right here, right? And this is a tricky one, right? Because you do have females that have a real strong jawline and they have a real pronounced chin, right? Uh, and then you have males that have a very petite, petite uh, mandible with hardly any mental eminence at all, right? So this is the one that you would probably want to use the least to sex a skeleton, right? And so is this one, right? Uh, but this one, I would say, is pretty good to use by itself, and so is this one, and maybe this one here. But the best thing that you can do is use them all in a combination, right? The more, the more traits you have to make a determination, the closer, the more accurate you're going to be. I hope that makes sense. Now, here's another set of uh, markers right here. This is called the greater sciatic notch, like we saw in that photo. In other words, this is the, this is the birth canal, right? The, the wider and bigger it is, the more female it is, the narrower it is, it will be a male because males don't have birth canals because they don't give birth to kids, right? I believe only the seahorse is the only male in nature huh, that does that, right? So uh, there we go. This is probably, probably the best mark, probably the best mark, right? But then again, you always need to keep into consideration if the person is petite, if the person is pretty robust, right? Uh, because we do have this designations in anthropology uh, for robust and gracile, right? Sometimes you'll have a robust female, right? And then you'll have a gracile male. So you need to be really careful. But again, the more markers you have to make a determination, the better. Uh, here's another one. Uh, uh, here you have a male, uh, Oscar. We call it Oscoxa. You guys might want to call it hips or hip bones, etc. Right? So here's a male, there's a female, and here's what we have the pubis or the pubic synthesis right here. Right? Uh, that angle right there can sometimes determine if this is a male or a female. In my experience, females kind of like arc in a little bit more than that, and males usually round up a little more than that. Right? But then again, because of human variation, that's what we call it in anthropology, right? 
you cannot make 100% determination just based on this guys right here. So the best thing to do is to have these guys here along with the sciatic notches right there and the skull. All right? So the more the merrier. But out in the field is not always possible. All right? So you sometimes have to take your chances. And we're, we're, we're going to be coming back at this one pretty soon. Now, as far as chronological age goes, before we get into this one, again, the first thing that you need to do when you do bioarchaeology work is determine if this person that you're looking at is a male or a female, again, because of sexual dimorphism, because females mature quicker than guys, etc. cetera. Right? These are the age groups that we use right, based on the work of Weichstra and Ubelacher, et cetera, several other authors, right? Uh, the age groups here, perinatal, child, juvenile, adult, 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 young adult, etc. And these are the approximate age ranges, right? And they have to be in range. Like for instance, when you, if somebody asks you, how old are you? In my case, I'm 63. Okay, that sounds good, but that's not exact. 63 in how many months? Okay, 63, I don't know, forget it. Four months. Okay, not exact. 63, how many months and how many weeks? And then how many days? And then how many hours? And then how many minutes? And how many seconds, right? And it all depends on how anal retentive you are about this, right? So, yeah. If I somebody, if I find the skeleton, I go, yeah, he looks like he was like 39 on the dot. It's impossible. That, that, that's, that's a stupid uh, determination, right? After you do your analysis and you think this guy's still at 39, he's got to be in that range right there. It could be, it could be 39 and a half. 39 and three quarters, 38 and three quarters, or actually 41 or 42. Does that make sense, right? That's why we use ranges here. And also the police also has to use ranges unless they have like a good identification of it. Right. So let's see, what else can I say about this? Uh, these are the codes that we use for our paperwork, right? For those of you who see, who like Indiana Jones and all that stuff, it's not like that. Not like that at all. I look at Indiana Jones and like, ah, well, Bunch of crap. Right? Because compared to the real deal, archaeology, a lot of paperwork. There's a lot of paperwork. It's pretty exciting, right? And sometimes the paperwork is exciting, but uh, no Indiana Jones, trust me. So let's see. I don't even use music, some of these things. Okay, to determine chronological age, especially on babies, right? Subatoms, we use dental charts, right? Uh, and these charts here, they're pretty well understood, right? In some cases, they work perfectly, and some other cases don't, right? Because uh, when this was put together, if I'm not mistaken, uh, it was used with some Native American tribes from the United States. Now, does it apply to American tribes in Mexico or South America? We sometimes assume that they do, but then again, we have age ranges as well. See, see what I'm saying? So if they don't apply, they might be off by, let's say, two years, it still fits within a range, right? The, the darkened teeth that you see here is your mi milk teeth, the deciduous teeth. The ones that, I don't know, the tooth fairy takes away. Right? And over here, you start seeing your adult teeth, right? And here's your wisdom teeth right there, right there. And here they're forming in what we call the crypt, right? Up here is the maxilla and the mandible. And they haven't popped out, popped out yet. You will notice that Here's 15 years plus or minus three. You usually get your wisdom teeth out fully erupted around 1920, right? Depends on your genetics, right? So if a person does not have wisdom teeth, we call it a subadult. It includes all this. If a person has wisdom teeth, we call them an adult, right? So in this case here, the 21 year old already has a wisdom teeth pretty much developed and had erupted out of the nose, right? And here you have 35. So the deal here, if you have a person that's over 21 years old, and you're using the dental chart to tell the age of the person, how are you going to use it? There's no way that you can use the chart anymore. Then you rely on the rest of the skeleton to tell the chronological age of a person. And I'm going to show you an example here pretty, pretty soon. Okay, uh, this burial uh, here, there with no root, and the same incisor here has a little bit of a, little bit of a root, so it's got to be in between there. I hope that's clear, all right? So this little guy right here, uh, number one, when, when somebody is this young, there's no way that you can actually tell what sex the kid was. Uh, puberty hasn't set in, 
therefore sexual dimorphism has to say it. It all has to do with sexual dimorphism, right? And it's associated with, with puberty, right? Uh, hormones and all that kind of stuff. When you're too young and puberty hasn't kicked in, then you don't have, I don't know, hair in your underarm, you don't have a beard, etc. I think you guys understand that, right? So let's, let's move on here. So in this case here, you see the skeleton from the concertina full of dirt. Right? It's like encased in dirt. This is what we call a block. They have to be excavated out of blocks because in order to not ruin your data, your excavation techniques have to be right on the money, right? And sometimes you don't have time to train the locals on how to excavate a burial because after all, a human skeleton has about 206 different bones, right? And if you do not understand that, you are risking leaving part of that person behind which does not go through. It's not a good thing, especially in forensic cases, right? Where they can actually sue you and strip you from your liberty. Right? So here, the first thing I had to do was clear this little kid from, uh, from the block. They did all the stuff, right? We came up with the conclusion that the kid was about three or four years old. There was no way to tell the sex of the kid, the biological sex of the kid, and there was no way to tell why the kid died. And so there was actually two of them, right? And uh, they were about the same age. They were about the same age. So next. Now, once you get past uh, understanding how effective that dental chart is, you can also look at bones here, individual bones, like in this case, a humerus, right? And you will notice that here is a complete bone, and this part right here is actually separated here, separated there, there, and there, right? Well, we do have equations that tell us if we like measure the degree of separation here, we can actually tell the approximate age when the person died, right? Like in this case, you have somebody who died at birth, five years of age, 10 years, 15 years, 16 plus. In other words, this guy was a subadult born into adulthood, right? And here's what we call the epiphysis, uh, diaphysis, and I don't remember that one. So metaphysis actually and diaphysis. Uh, then we can also look at x-rays. For instance, this is your that chin, not this one. Uh, here you have what we call the facial lines, and over here we do not have it. So as you're growing up, those lines remain open, right? But then when you turn into adult, they fuse. So for simplicity, this bone here and that bone there turn into one bone. Does that make sense? And completely fused in females around 17, males around 20. You see, you notice here that females actually uh, stop growing before males do in most cases, right? There's obviously there's exceptions, right? And that's what we call human variation. Here's another example, the radius right here. On the radius, you have that epiphyseal line right there, and on this one, you don't have it anymore. So we're looking at two individuals here. Uh, in females, it fuses around 16 to 17, in males, 17 to 20, according to Bass, and this latest edition was 2005. Right? So this is how we can also determine the age of a person. But then again, remember, determining the sex is the first thing, right? Because there is variation on maturity on males, between males and females. Uh, in this case here, uh, we have an ulna and radius, Right, this is uh, the radius, and that is the old now. This is what helps you prolong the soup into your arm. And here you will see that there's no epiphyseal lines anymore, so most likely this guy was on the top. Now, here, getting back here, in order to determine middle to older adult age determination, right? We have this thing called the pubis right here, pubis emphasis, which is right here in front of obviously the pubic area. Uh, this one over here is the ischium, and that one is the ilium right there for a male and a female. Again, this one angles in, this one angles out, if you will. But the pubis, pubic synthesis right here, when you look at, right now it's sort of like looking at the side, but when you actually look at it head on, it can tell you the sex of the individual in some cases and the approximate age, right? So if you take this little part, <coughs> right there, and you turn it towards you, that's what they start looking like. So here you have female, and then you have male, okay, and uh, there's uh, at least two ways of determining it. One is called the Suki Brutes, 
method, and the other one's called the Todd method, and I don't remember the name of the other one, right? But supposedly, uh, the amount of wear will give you an edge determination, right? Because you gotta keep in mind that your hips, if you will, your oscoxy is not one solid piece of bone. You got at least six of them, right? And because you jump and run and kick and all that kind of stuff, they have to have room to move. Otherwise, they just fall apart, right? And one of the parts where they move, or where, I'm sorry, where there is some room to move would be right here. And uh, on the other side, called the auricular surfaces, right? Which is actually here somewhere. And eventually, that wears with time especially if you're very, very young, right? That's why some people question the method. But at this point, we don't have anything better than I know of, so we use this method to determine the age of this individual, right? And uh, it was buried of eight in the field, right? And she did not be, according to this, like between 35 and 40, right? We got that at the end of the, <coughs> end of the lecture. But even something as small as this can actually be an indicator, right, of what you're looking for. Uh, now, as far as ancient diseases go, okay, some of the stuff that we look at is osteoarthritis, right? Because most of you are going to go through it. Actually, I already need a knee replacement. <laughs> yeah. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen to all of us, right? It's part of, human, part of the human condition, and in some cases, it's just wear and tear, right? It's totally wear and tear. I used to be a jogger, and that killed my knees, right? And then in some cases, it's just genetics, right? You just have bad genes, right? So uh, degenerative joint disease, or known as osteoarthritis, is basically the degenerative change to the articular features, right? You have, your arm can do this here, right? It's got a head, and it's got like a socket, right? The socket's called like a glenoid fossa or something like that. And I'm gonna show you an example of that. And the head is called the humeral head. And the way we can tell that this person is having osteoarthritis, we look what we call for evernation, in the case of uh, uh, the spine, bony growths or osteophytes in the vertebra, which we didn't see any in the in Argentina, at least we didn't photograph any, lipping or building up a bone along joint margins, right? So I'm gonna give you an example here. This is the humeral head right here. Uh, this is the right side. So this is part of the humerus right here. There's a humerus right here, that's the head, and it actually articulates like this, right? So here you will notice that there's sort of like shiny, shiny stuff, right? That's what we call evernation. So most likely what happened here, the cartilage between the humeral, humeral head and the glenoid fossa wore away, and then you start rubbing bone on bone. And that's when it starts to hurt, right? When you, when you start getting the knee, when you need to have knee replacement, it's because you're already rubbing bone on bone, and there's no turning back, there's no cure for it. So uh, that here actually connects to that glenoid fossa right here in the scapula, like this, right? So you are looking at that right there, right there. Right. So here you see some lipping, then you also see some hibernation. So we can tell that this person was having osteoarthritis up here. I'm actually have development, the, development, developing it as well, right? which makes it kind of hard to sleep on the side. Right? So uh, uh, let's see what else we can say about this one. I don't have any, any vertebrae to show you because we didn't photograph any of those, and I don't have any knees to show you because we didn't find them. Right? Now here, as far as paleopathology again, another common uh, pathology that we find out in the field is anemia, right? Iron deficiency anemia, which is like an iron in the diet, low birth weight, parasitic infections, right? And again, not that I want to be sexist, right? But iron deficiency anemia happens to females more than does to males, right? Why? Because females lose iron when they, menst when they menstruate, right? And as far as I know, males don't menstruate, right? So again, that is because of sexual dimorphism, nature, God, whatever you want to call it, right? So, but it is a fact. So here we have uh, some sort of like indicators. Fibra orbitalia, polaric hyperostosis, and expanded diplo on your skull. Okay, again, not from La Consentida, but this is so you can have an idea what fibra orbitalia would look like inside your eye sockets. Right? I've never seen one in the field, 
because usually the inside of the sockets are usually gone because of the fun. They don't last that long, right? And uh, this one over here is actually the parietal superior late again. You can see that shiny side right there. What happened to this person that they, dev they developed they developed it up there. It kind of looked like a little mohawk, like a fine comb, you know, fine comb to mo mohawk right there that actually gets remodeled and heals as the person grows and starts eating better. Right? But we can actually spot it. Right? So every time you see something shiny in a bone, it's because what we call remodeling. And the bone remodel itself for, I don't know, it's a countermeasure for illness or something. So we do see those a lot in the field, and uh, we don't know exactly what to do with it, other than it happens more to females than it does to males, right? And uh, in this case here, and this is uh, from modern days here from Ortner, right? You can see the diplo right there, some depression back here, expanded diplo right there. Obviously, the person doesn't survive. I don't know, I don't know that that even killed it, right? But uh, just an extra. Now, the next one here, as far as in tissue goes, right? Uh, we have linear enamel hypoplasia, which is basically a, an interruption in the development of enamel in your teeth. You know you have enamel, then you have underneath uh, uh, dentin underneath it, right? When you pass through systemic nutritional stress, your body stops developing enamel, and we can track it, right? And actually, we have reverse engineering type of calculations that can tell us at what age, approximately, when I say age, by the way, all of it is approximate. We never say exact because that is like, that, 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 that's a big mistake, right? So we have calculations, reverse engineer calculations, that will let us know the approximate age when the kid right, developed that malnutritious, uh, I don't know, period or something. Uh, shoot, 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 again. Cavities, dental caries, periodontitis, right? If you don't have it, you will get it, right? Because there's no escape from that. Calculus, also known as tartar, unless you're really good with the toothpaste and the toothbrush, you'll also get it. Uh, Pre-mortem tooth loss, you know, like when you start losing your teeth like me, right? And then your body recovers. We can see that in the field. This is basic attrition, wear and tear on teeth, if you will. And this one's a pretty nasty one, abscesses, right? So here's an example of a hypoplasia. You, can, you, you will notice right there how the enamel did not build up. Right there. So what we normally do out in the field, provided we have the right equipment, we actually take a measurement from that line right there. This, that is the root, and that is a tooth right there, and that would be what? a premolar, right? That is called the sort of like the cement enamel junction, or the neck, if you will. So we can actually measure from here to here, or from here to there, enter it in our equations, and it will give us the approximate age as to when the person went through it. Now, the reasons why they go through all of this, okay? Uh, obviously, there's many reasons, but one, probably the one archaeologists love the most is weaning, when you wean a kid from breast milk, right? Uh, they say, and I'm pretty sure it's true, that breast milk is the best thing somebody can drink when they're little. And then when you pull them away from the breast, and then you start giving them regular food, there's sort of like a decline in health a little bit. And supposedly it's reflected on this. Uh, some archaeologists buy it 100%, some of us don't buy it 100%, right? I'll, I'll leave that up to you. And here you see periodontal disease. Again, this is uh, the maxilla, and this bone here should come all the way down to the junction, right? But you notice that it's not, right? In some cases, like up here, is probably because of the fine. Something happened here, right? And uh, it just flicked off. But in this case, you can actually see that the bone receded, right? And this happens, it's gonna happen with age, right? Or it happens because you get an infection, right? Because you don't floss or whatever, right? So uh, uh, you can see it over here as well. There's the junction and here's the recess uh, bone right there, if you will. As far as cavities go, okay, now this individual was in real sad shape because actually this individual apparently had an abscess that probably killed him. Right? And, and, and I believe it was on that. So here you see some, some caries right there, right? 
Uh, oh, here is just dirt, no big deal. Over here, you see there is the tires right there. You can see the roots right there, the neck right there, and then you see the bone how it's been like uh, going through necrosis, I believe is it, the term, right? It's all like eats itself and just wears away, right? It just disappears. Hmm, what else can I say about this one? Not much. Uh, pre mortem or ante mortem tooth loss. You will see that this person is actually missing. Uh, M1, M2, here's M3, which is actually your wisdom teeth, right? Just, just raise your hand if you don't mind, if, if they already pulled your wisdom teeth, right? Uh, uh, obviously, nowadays, most people will get their wisdom teeth pulled out, right? But it wasn't so back in the past. It appears that because of evolution and dietary changes, right, our faces are retracted. Right? We don't have that pragmatism that apes have anymore, right? Because now we cook our food, we cut it in little pieces, so we don't need a lot of strength in our jaw muscles anymore, right? And remember, bone development has to do with muscle strength, right? So in this case here, and in most cases that I see archaeologically, right, they have their wisdom taken in there, and the rest of the division is nice and straight. So what happens to us if they don't take out our wisdom teeth? We're not going to die, right? We just end up looking like, I don't know, Austin Powers and stuff, right? With a bunch of crooked teeth, right? But it's really more a matter of cosmetics, right? There's something about American culture here that our teeth have to be white and they have to be straight. And it's not the case in other places in the world, including in England, where uh, Austin Powers comes from. <laughs> <laughs> so here we have again, uh, Redontitis, and then this person lost the woman because it was a female, lost her teeth. And she was about 45 to 50, something like that, right? We'll get you the exact uh, date, our uh, age when we, when we finish here. And she, her teeth were better than mine. I mean, and she was like one of the last burials found, right? And like I told you at the beginning, it appears that the oldest burials are the best preserved and, you know, when you compare them with the newer burials, right? So, and this is a clear example. She had perfect dentition, she had attrition, right? Uh, wear and tear, right? Because they're still grinding food, right? They, they are grinding food, you get some of that grain in the food, it works your teeth evenly, nothing nothing strange about that. Uh, now, this is the fellow here that had the bad cavities, right? As far as we are concerned, that is an abscess right there. And there's probably another one back here, right? Anybody ever had abscesses? Okay, what happens when abscesses? You start developing pus. And then that pus has to go out, otherwise, your face will explode, right? And it goes out through what we call a cloaca, as gross as that sounds. <laughs> and uh, if you don't watch it, right, and you go to sleep, and that pus is kind of gushing out of the cloaca, what do you think you're doing? You're actually swall swallowing it while you're asleep, right? And that's not going to kill you, I don't think, but once that infection turns into septicemia and gets into your bloodstream, it will most likely kill you, right? So if you hate going to the dentist, just look at this poor fellow here, and this is most likely the cause of death, septicemia, right? I mean, that's no joke right there, right? How the teeth managed to stay there after having that hole right there is beyond me, right? But it must have been really painful and it must have been really horrible. And that's what we think killed this guy because it was a male. But actually, you can see that big mental amendment right there. So uh, as far as I remember, this guy was a, was a male, right? So there you go. Next time you gotta go see the dentist, just think about this one, right? <laughs> It'll change your attitude. Uh, here you have the new field designation, the new designations, right? After everything was said and done, burial one, burial eight actually turns into burial 12, uh, burial four turns, turns into burial 11, individual 13, etc. right? So here we have two to four years of age, head to the Northeast, that female that I just told you about, 45 to 50, head to the southwest, head to the southwest, east, northeast, and just so you get an idea, right, uh, they were pointing in that direction, or in that direction, only one, and maybe towards the south, and two towards the east. So what happens in the east? The sun rises, right? So when you're doing bio, bio archaeology work, it's very important to keep track on the orientations of the body, because that begins at Archaeoastronomy, right? It hints at 
People might have been marking the solstices, the equinoxes, the dates in between. For instance, uh, you guys heard of the equinoxes and solstices, right? Uh, summer solstice, winter solstice, equinoxes here. We have data that actually suggests that here in California, not only they broke the year in four seasons, but most likely eight, which, which we, be, and hopefully we'll get to present that soon, we believe that is probably the only instance of that type of sophisticated astronomy for hunter-gatherers in the entire Gatlin County, right? So we're pretty proud of that, and hopefully we'll get to present it. Hopefully we'll get to present it soon, All right? So uh, this goes, these are pearls. Every time, every time you, you look at parents, look how they're oriented. Look at their position. Look at everything. Not just, not just the scale. Look at the whole cultural context, right? And you're definitely going to get more information than, than, than what you first thought you were going to get. So let's get back here. So here's the oldest burial, second oldest burial. Again, the older the burials, the better preserved the one. That, that little kid. Right? It was one of the, I can't remember if it was this one or the other one. There's another one here, so this one right here. Can't remember which one it was, but I would have to look at my notes. I do have to look so. uh, Here you have the sex. In some cases, it was undetermined. In some cases, it was female. And in some cases, it was male. But most of them were probable, 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 and undetermined. Why? Because of the fun. Right? A lot of people don't understand how much the fun of me can ruin everything for Right? When you have good taphonomy, happy bones. Bad taphonomy, sad archaeologists, right? <laughs> I just made that one up. <laughs> so here's the eight ratios right here. As you can see, we have little kids, and then we have this female here. This female, believe it or not, was the oldest one in the time span, and the oldest one in age, and she was the best preserved. She was better preserved than everybody else. And apparently she had what... Uh, Facets right here because you will be squatting to make <coughs> tortillas or make tamales, I don't know, or, you know, etc. Right? So, uh, a very intriguing. We plan to do what we call an osteobiography of her pretty soon. And we're going to be talking about her only, right? which actually should be pretty interesting. And what I was going to say about this uh, over 18, because we had no way to come up with a better age, unknown. It happens, right? Sometimes your parents are so destroyed that you cannot tell anything, right? Actually, uh, I got to, I went to the site and I dug a burial up and it was so deteriorated that all you had was sort of like, like bone signature on the dirt. There was no, it looked like bone, but it was a film, right? And, and this was like a full grown individual. When we actually took everything out, I think like it all fitted like in the palm of my hand. That's how bad the economy was in some of these cases, right? So uh, I wish I would have been able to show you more, but at least you get an idea the kind of stuff that we run into every time we're out there, right? And let's see what I was going to say about this. Again, the radio carbon dates right there, those time periods, they're right on the money, as far as right on the money can be with the present technology, right? I believe radio carbon dating goes back to 45,000 uh, years in the past with an accuracy of plus or minus, get this, 20 years. 20 years, that is very accurate, right? And uh, there's a lot of people out in the country, right, in our country that question radio carbon day. No, 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 it's, it's very good, it's very, very good. Otherwise, I, I wouldn't be up if it wasn't, right? So let's see what else I got. Okay, burial orientations, never forget that, never forget that. Every archeological site that has some form of architecture, is most likely aligned to the cardinal points, to the compass points, right? And in some cases, like here in San Diego, or Northern Baja, and Southern Baja, rocks are actually aligned to the cardinal points that actually gives us markers for the summer solstice, or winter solstice, equinoxes, and dates in between, and even some dates that we have no clue what they mean. Right? You just gotta be careful about this, right? Now here, uh, we're about to finish here. Uh, final burial nomenclature is right there. Most of them had something with them, and in some cases, uh, some were offerings or possible offerings, and that falls into the decision. That's the decision of the archaeologist. Right? Obviously, I'm an archaeologist. I've been an archaeologist for over 20 years, but I specialize in human remains, right? Which I'm looking at a different thing that 
let's say your project director is looking at, right? Obviously, I understand what he's doing, and I, and I know what he's doing, and, and I can look at the same, at, at all this stuff and agree with him or not, right? But this is not, uh, let's say, it's not my main function. My main function is the bones, right? But in this case here, Blackstone beef from a probable bracelet, right? Archaeology, uh, probably the only good line they have in, in, in Indiana Jones is not an exact science. You guys remember hearing that? That's probably like the only true thing they said about archaeology, right? <laughs> so, so that's why sometimes we use probable. Right? Why? Because we don't know exactly, but by using the word probable, we admit that we don't know. As to oppose, yeah, that's what it is, and risking being wrong. Does that make sense, right? Figuring fragments, an ocarina is like a little flute, right? Uh, carbonized seed. Uh, this one here was uh, was kind of hard to identify. Cro cro uh, fragment of a crocodile uh, mandible, right? Again, my specialty is human remains, not faunal remains, not animal. Actually, I don't like animals that much, right? So, uh, <laughs> uh, here we have an effigy. Uh, Stone, a mono to grind food, ceramic bottles, etc. I know uh, all the stuff here is pretty basic. Now, if you look at the dental pathologies and skeletal pathologies, right? This is the this is the final chart, right? Uh, here we have lost primordium on that lady, mild periodontitis, uh, left mandibular M2, right? That she lost for other hyperostosis, uh, erudition of femoral condyles, vertebral lip, lipping, etc. Carries, 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 periodontitis, linear enamel hypoplasias, uh, and this individual was five of them, the onset, using those equations, three years of age, five years of age, and six years of age. Something happened to this person during that age, right, that went through a period of malnutrition, right? And again, when you take the kid off the breast milk, it can happen, right? But because of these people have cultural practices that we don't know, we don't understand 100 percent I cannot tell you what 100 percent that it was because the kid was weaned, right? Because different cultures, I like to think, wean the kids from the breast at different ages, right? And in some cases, right, uh, the kids stay a little longer than, than usual, right? So uh, let's see what else can I say about this. Uh, the abscess right there, most likely killed this guy. Every nation on the left and uh, from all condyle. In some cases, which one is it? This one here. Slight deformation in the right mandibular condyle. Sometimes you get osteoarthritis in your jaw here. I believe mean, they call it a trick jaw or something like that, right? When you open up your mouth and you feel like a click. It's got like a scientific name on it, but I don't remember what it is, right? A uh, trick jaw sounds good enough. Uh, we can spot all that. Uh, let's see what else. Okay, now. Let me see, before we get into the final, let me see if there's something else I want to say about this. Again, the age groups right there, how old the burials are. Uh, attrition here, all of them, their teeth were worn because of diet, most likely, right? But eventually, all our teeth are going away, right? When you see like little spots on your teeth, they're not usually cavities or caries, it's dented. You, you wore away the enamel, and then the dents start showing up. And if I'm not mistaken, enamel in certain parts of the brain are the only tissues that never regenerate, right? You can break a bone, put it back together, the bone will regenerate and fuse again, right? Your skull, you can crack it open, close it, it will re regenerate, but once you start losing enamel, it's done, right? Like when you chip a tooth, right? It's gone. You, 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 they gotta put some gold or something, they gotta put something in it, right? But you're never gonna get it back. And what else do we have here? Again, as you can see, all the stuff here, periodontitis, uh, hypoplasias, everything is pretty standard for an archaeological uh, collection. There's nothing here strange that we haven't seen before. What actually was nice, just to realize that one guy died most likely because of an abscess. We've seen abscesses before, right, but not that big which suggests it was a big infection, a couple of the infections this person had, that most likely killed. But that's about it, right? And anything other than that is all standard. We really didn't uh, learn too much from these burials because 
let's face it, it's only 14 burials, right? Most likely there's more, which we're probably gonna go back next year, right? Uh, provided we get the funds from the NSF, and I'm probably gonna have to come back and do this again, right? So now, uh, this is the fun part here, right? Uh, the baby and the lady, they got from, they were from here, and here, another kid. The deeper the burial, the more preserved they are, right? Now remember, obviously, you want to know why, right? How come it's older yet better preserved, right? It's not a miracle, right? So what's happening here is that the taphonomy here is way better than the taphonomy up here, right? Uh, Oaxaca, especially because of Oaxaca, is very hot and it rains a lot. You have very severe rainy seasons and very severe dry seasons. So what happens in between, you know? The ground actually moves up and down, uh, actually expands and contracts, if you will, and whatever happens to the ground happens to the skeletons. It's affecting the skeletons. Now here you will notice, obviously the surface, and then you will notice all that ugly looking kind of soil right there. It's just rain percolating through the surface. That makes sense, but it never makes it that deep, right? Because probably by the time the, the, the percolation gets to here, then the weather patterns start to change and it gets hot again. Right? It doesn't give it a chance to go all the way down there. Most likely, that is the reason why the burials here are better preserved than the ones on top. The ones over here have better taphonomy than the ones up here. Another thing, now that is a biological determination. An archaeological determination made by the, by the boss, if you will, is that here we don't have evidence of agriculture in terms of corn and corn processing, which means no manos, no metates, or any of that. We actually start seeing them appear somewhere, right? And again, that's on the archeological side, right? I'm just telling you what this guy told me anyway, right? So here, no manos, no grinding implements, right? Which means a cleaner diet, right? And up here, after the development of agriculture and the domestication of corn, you start seeing manos and metates, right? Which means more grit on the diet, which means more attrition on the teeth, which means more caries and all that kind of stuff, right? So uh, there's two ways to explain why these guys uh, are better looking than these other guys, right? One of them is good taphonomy, no agriculture, bad taphonomy, and bad agriculture. I mean, and developed agriculture. That makes sense. Let's see, I think uh, there's a bibliography right there. This is the guy right here. We actually got some articles off, right? We did the histological work. Sandberg did the, all the histological work. It was pretty good work, but uh, that is not my side of things. I'm more like a morphological, hands-on kind of guy, right? And I think that's it. So, that's it. Let me turn the lights. Does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, Jimmy. Why did you go deeper, the, the, the units that were farther back? Like, why didn't, didn't work? Why don't the units go, go deeper down to the level of the people? Oh, because there was nothing there. When we ran the auger, we found out that... No, no, no that was auger was, was out the other end, the deep part. Oh, okay, on the, the other shower part. On the step ones. I don't know. That would, actually, that's a good question for the archaeologists. I believe they were following... I believe they were following the bones as they were popping up. You know, you, you start scraping dirt and you see a piece of bone. So, okay, let's take this one down on a one by one. And if there's nothing underneath it, we leave it, right? And probably that's what they were doing, but I don't think that's a good point. I, I will ask you, I will ask you. Anybody else? Uh, hang on a second, let me get it. I don't want to put them on, so let me get those. <laughs> Mark, thank you. Okay. Uh, this slide showed the orientation. Uh, there was a lot of variation. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't see a whole bunch of consistency, southwest, mm -hmm. north. Mm -hmm. Why? Don't know. We really don't know. I did some uh, analysis on 300 skeletons on the side close to this one, and they're all basically north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, northwest, southeast, but nothing in between. It seems like those eight points in the compass rows were utilized, right? Now, if there's any, like, north, south, east, and west, that's pretty simple. That usually has no bearing on much, other than the sun generally comes up through the east. But when you're looking at southeast or southwest, or northeast and northwest, then you're probably talking about alignments with the, with the sources and stuff like that. But because the architecture has been deteriorated by the jungle, 
there's no way to have a point of reference. But again, I will just do in the bio. Hopefully next year, I will do a little bit of the art history. Anybody else? Wait a second. Let me get close. <laughs> That's what I do with my students. Have you done any studies whether um, uh, associated funerary objects are associated with male or female? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I did. But uh, I'm afraid I can't talk about that. But uh, my, my boss, he did that. And you saw in the chart that there were some offerings right there. Yeah. I don't know exactly what his conclusions were because, again, I'm a biohacker. Right. Anybody else? I can hear pretty well, though. <laughs> <laughs> Are you familiar with the Archer burial in your still hedge? He had an abscess. I'm familiar with Stonehenge, but not, not that familiar. But particularly. The Archer had, had a bad abscess, too. I wonder if he cut No, I didn't know that. But uh, it, would be nice. it would be nice to get that data. Because we are going back. We're definitely going back. But this is the triangle with the abscess. What? Well, it's a triangle with the abscess. Oh, yeah. 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 A triangle there. Yeah. But uh, I wouldn't know how to explain. Do you want to explain? Well, if She understands it way better than I do. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I know you mentioned that the the lady was with the other child, but what were the other shared uh, burial? You mentioned there was two. Ah, uh, yeah, there was two kids. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. If I'm not mistaken, the other kid was here or here. Again, this was part. Of being an archaeologist is one thing. Being a bioarchaeologist is a different thing, right? And in some cases, instead of me being digging here, I was in the lab otherwise. Mm -hmm. But I can't eat. I can I can dig them out of my problem. That's not me. So I really don't know the exact answer to that question. Anybody else? Kind of a specific question, but uh, I was doing surveys in Guanajuato several years ago on um, caves and viridial activity. Um, and found a couple of human bones. It wasn't super really relevant to the project, but beyond identifying them as a carpal and a, a big toe bone, um, never did anything with the ages. But how would you go about that if you have you know pictures and measurements and uh, just pictures and measurements? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, where, um, it's like, like, where would I find the resources to actually like look at like a, I don't know, sort of size charts of uh, bones in that region? Now, now, if I understand your question correctly, right? yeah. it's uh, if I just have pictures and measurements of bones, right? Uh -huh. uh, if you look at the bass book, right? Once you identify the bone, you can actually measure and come up with heights and stuff like that, right? The height of a person. You have the reverse equation. But if you do not know the exact sex of the individual, then uh, you're yeah. going to come up, okay, if this guy was a male, was uh -huh. this high, was tall, if this, if this was a female, she was also this tall. But if you do not know the sex of the individual, and again, using photographs is not the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. right? uh, you're going to struggle with it. Okay. But it's not impossible. You just okay. got to be persistent. Okay, cool. Thanks. Did I answer the question? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? Well, thank you so much. I'm hungry. <laughs>